Well, I, I think you'd have to say that it is, in fact, that, that war is simply a way of life. And so many people are involved in that war making or that those war preparations and the national security world that goes with it. I mean, it, it, it can't be simply literally profits, although profits are there to be made. I mean, you know, vast no-bid contracts to mercenary corporations, uh, uh, you know, contracts for all sorts of uh, uh, security equipment, surveillance equipment, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's, there's, there's plenty of money to be made. But I think basically the, there, there's a mindset that goes with, that goes with American war making, and it's a very narrow one in which over the years alternatives have been simply wiped out, and they're no longer conceivable. I mean, there are certain words that have lost their meaning. I mean, peace is an obvious one, peace. I mean, Americans do talk about peace, but peace no longer has any meaning. Uh, it's not the opposite of war, it's just something you say in passing. War has become the new norm. Uh, it's not so new, of course, but it's become the norm of our American world, and, and our world remains so oblivious to it. I mean, um, if you look out there in the rest of the world, we have, over many years, been fighting constant small wars without end. Um, we've garrisoned the planet. We have hundreds and hundreds of military bases, some literally, in, as in Afghanistan and Iraq, in single countries. Uh, we have troops all over the world. We have, uh, bizarrely enough, 17 um, intelligence agencies in the um, what's called the uh, U.S. intelligence community. I, I, it's hard to imagine. I mean, with a, a, a budget that's something like $55 billion, Th these, are, these are startling figures, you know, trying to imagine. Yes, you can imagine a country that needs intelligence with an intelligence agency, maybe even two intelligence agencies, you know, so that there'd be something competitive. But 17, you know, including one layer of bureaucracy after another, ha this, is, this is not intelligence. This is a way of life, and that intelligence has been militarized. This is just to talk about intelligence, so that, you know, when you get the new director of national intelligence, it has to be a military man now. Why? Americans don't think of Washington as a war capital. They don't think of us as a war state or in a state of war. And yet, that is our reality over these years, uh, increasingly so. It's where our wealth is going, at least a significant hunk of it. It's the one thing in our world that we feed, like some cavernous maw of some sort. We just dump money into it. And when things don't work in any given situation, Iraq, Afghanistan, you know, whatever you want to mention, our answer is never to do less. It's never to scale back. It's always more. We expand. It's in Congress, if we pass a supplemental budget of $33 billion for Iraq and Afghanistan with a bunch of extra, many extra billions thrown in, Nobody even peeps. I mean, there's basically no discussion. It goes through. It's not really news. It doesn't make the front page, you know. And yet, if that same amount were applied, say, to American infrastructure, we'd be fighting like cats and dogs. It's quite interesting that in this context, um, when you look at the U.S. government and you think about blue skies thinking, um, you really can't find it on. I mean, education. Is anybody thinking about the American education system in 2035 or... Uh, the Amer American infrastructure in 2035 or anything like that? I doubt it. This is not where Americans are putting their money. And yet, when it comes to the military, um, we do have blue skies outfits who are preparing for the wars of 2015, 2035. What will the supersonic bomber of 2035 be like? We know that, but the American classroom of 2035, we don't think about that. It's clear where we're putting our effort, our creative effort, and, and our time and our money, and it's disturbing. You know, the major aspects of, of the American way of war, I would say, are, first of all, the military base. Unlike previous imperial powers, we don't actually conquer territory. But we do garrison the world in the way that nobody has ever garrisoned the world. I mean, you know, 
uh, acknowledged and unacknowledged uh, how many, who knows how many military bases. I mean, you see different figures. I mean, somewhere between 700 and maybe 1,200, depending on what you're counting. Sometimes, you know, as, as, as many as 400 in Afghanistan, micro to macro. I mean, it's quite amazing. There's air power. You know, Americans are experts in air power. And, um, uh, and, the, and, and our air wars in recent years have been largely ignored. Um, the only part of the air war that's been paid much attention to is drone warfare, uh, which is, what, which is a, a form of warfare we've been pioneering, which is quite striking, in which we have what in essence are robot assassins in the air 24-7 over our, not just over our war zones, but over areas like the Pakistani tribal border areas where, they're, where, they're, uh, uh, where we're not at war at all. The strange thing about drone warfare is that we've basically taken ourselves from the battlefield. This is very odd, and, and I think it, it catches something about the larger American way of war, because the American public itself has, in essence, either taken itself or been taken from the battlefields. Yes, we send out our proxies, we call them our troops, we talk about supporting them, and they are fighting our wars, but Americans are remarkably demobilized. Unlike most wars, there no sacrifices are made. The wars are often, for long periods, not discussed. They more or less disappear from the news. Rather, we're rather like, in that way, the, the, the pilots of these drones who, 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 who sit thousands of miles away, you know, maybe in Nevada or Langley, Virginia or wherever, uh, and who, at the end of their nine to five day of being in Afghanistan, um, drive home from a base in Nevada where there's a sign that says something like, watch out, you're entering the most dangerous part of your day because you're, you're driving out on an American highway, which is dangerous. Um, and that kind of detachment from war uh, is something that we pioneered. I mean, we pioneered it literally in robot warfare, which is going to lead uh, our latest wonder weapon, which will solve nothing and will lead to all sorts of future problems for the world. Uh, but we've pioneered it in another way, uh, partially by having an all-volunteer army and uh, by having no draft. We've somehow made it possible, to go back to one of your earlier questions, we've made it possible to, to, to make war endlessly because we've largely detached the American people from the very idea that we're making war most of the time. War generally in the last hundred years has shifted ever more towards the basically war against civilians. So we have the odd term collateral damage for killing civilians. You know, this is what the Pentagon calls it. But if you look at war realistically, including American war, it's the soldiers and the enemy troops, if they're there or guerrillas, who are in a way the collateral damage. The most central striking part of American war, although Americans very seldom deal with it, is the killing of civilians. We dealt with it when it was us, which was 9-11. 9-11 was the killing of thousands of civilians, the murder of thousands of civilians. When we have committed our own cumulative version of 9-11 in Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, and elsewhere, on the, in the Pakistani borderlands, we continually kill civilians. I write about this in the book, and Tom Dispatch uh, dot com has probably been the only site that, for instance, has kept count of the Iraqi and Afghan war uh, wedding parties that have been wiped out by American air power. You know, there are about seven of them at this point. I mean, that's startling. You would think a nation would be struck if you basically wiped out seven wedding parties. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of people in total over these years, starting in 2001, first one in 2001 in Afghanistan. Um, and yet, we have no reaction to this. It's not a news story. Nobody blinks, et cetera, et cetera. And yet, the killing of civilians is an integral part of, of the American way of war. It goes on endlessly. And if we don't feel it here, it's nonetheless felt elsewhere. If you want to talk about creating terrorists, creating future problems, talk about the families of those civilians killed. We don't think about that.